for facts that Jesus shared about Satan that many do not know. Jesus said a good deal about Satan. Number one, he called him the enemy and the evil one in Matthew chapter 13, verse 39. Jesus called Satan the enemy in the parable of the weeds, Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds? They asked. No, he replied. He will uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles and burn them and to put the wheat in the barn. Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 through 39. Then, leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. His disciples said, Please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. Jesus replied, The Son of Man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. An enemy dislikes or despises another person and seeks to harm, contradict, or fight the person he is set against. Thus, an enemy of God opposes God's presence and purposes in this world. The Bible names Satan the devil as God's specific adversary. As God's enemy, throughout history, Satan has sought to thwart God's plan, harm humans, and lead them away from God. Scripture names many other enemies of God and his people besides Satan. In the Bible, an enemy of God is also referred to as an adversary or a foe. Anyone who disobeys the Lord's commands is designated as God's enemy. Throughout the Bible, the devil is referred to as the evil one. John chapter 5, verse 19. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Believers are in God despite most humanity lying in Satan's power. Christ has come, and he has imparted spiritual insight. 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 13. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. Number two, the prince of this world. When Jesus was predicting his death, he made the statement, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. John chapter 12, verse 31. He said the world was about to crucify the Lord of life and glory. In doing so, it would condemn itself and the punishment would be passed upon it for its terrible renunciation of Christ. The condemnation was about to be passed on guilty humanity. The ruler of this world is Satan. In an authentic sense, Satan was utterly conquered by cavalry. He believed he had succeeded in doing away with the Lord Jesus once and for all. Instead, the Savior supplied a way of salvation for men and vanquished Satan and all his hosts simultaneously. The devil's sentence has not yet been carried out, but his fate has been sealed. He is still going about his evil business in the world, but it is only a matter of time before he is cast into the lake of fire. When the Lord knew that the time for his betrayal was coming and that he would not have much more time to talk with his own, Satan was drawing near, but the Savior knew that the adversary could find no shame of sin in him. There was nothing in Christ to respond to the devil's evil temptations. It would be silly for anyone else but Jesus to say that Satan could find nothing in him. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. John chapter 14, verse 30. Satan rules a world that includes men and angels separated from God. This world engulfs false religionists and threatens to defeat the true children of God. 1 John chapter 2, 
verses 15 through 17, New International Version. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. His impact extends to the world's ideologies, education, and commerce. He controls the world's thoughts, ideas, speculations, and false religions, which arose from his lies and deceptions. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, Amplified Bible. But the Pharisees heard it and said, This man casts out demons only by the help of Beelzebub, Satan, the prince of the demons. Romans chapter 8, verses 7 through 8, Amplified Bible. The mind of the flesh with its sinful pursuits is actively hostile to God. It does not submit itself to God's law since it cannot. And those who are in the flesh, living a life that caters to sinful appetites and impulses, cannot please God. This cosmos is Satan's counterpart to God's rule and kingdom. His desire to be like God led to his sin, and now he heads over all rebels who, like him, have fallen into sin. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14, Amplified Bible. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. This world aims to defeat the true children of God. John chapter 8, verse 44, Amplified Bible. You are of your father the devil, and it is your will to practice the desires which are characteristic of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks what is natural to him, for he is a liar and the father of lies and half-truths. Number four, that he is desired to have Peter. Peter's life is perhaps the most excellent redemption story ever written. He was a fisherman, and fishermen were stereotypically men of action, very physical and unafraid of others, which Peter demonstrates in the Bible. However, Peter faced a significant challenge as the devil had a mark on him, and Jesus informed him of this to give authority to this quandary. At the Last Supper, Jesus warned Simon Peter that a test of faith was coming. Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. The outspoken disciple appeared to be in a predicament. Satan wanted to sift Peter as wheat, which means he tried to shake Peter's faith so violently that he fell, demonstrating that God's faithful servant lacked confidence. But it wasn't just Peter who was in danger. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31, the word for you is plural. Jesus told Peter that Satan had set his sights on all disciples. Some translations, like the Berean Study Bible, specify the whole group. Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. This passage gives us a glimpse into an unseen world. It raises many questions, but it also affords many assurances, the chief of which is the chain of command. God is clearly in control, and the devil is on a short leash. Did you notice the verb that followed Satan's name? Ask. Satan has asked. The outspoken disciples seem to be in the same predicament as Job when Satan sought to put him to the test. Job chapters 1 through 2. Job chapter 1, verse 10. Hast not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Nothing was demanded, resolved, or decided by the devil. He was curious and requested permission to tempt Simon Peter, in the same way he asked to tempt Job. Doesn't it change our perception of the old snake? God will use all beings for the sake of his kingdom. The word Satan means adversary or accuser. He charges God's people with doing wrong. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Then the angel showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, with Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Sift as wheat is a metaphor that can also mean shake someone apart. In biblical times, wheat or grain was sifted through a sieve or large strainer. As the grain was violently shaken, 
the dirt and other impurities that clung to it during the threshing process separated from the good, usable grain. Satan's goal in sifting Peter and the other disciples as wheat was to crush them and destroy their faith. In reality, the adversary seeks to destroy every believer's faith. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus guaranteed Peter, I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Luke chapter 22, verse 32. The early church's leadership demonstrated that the Lord's prayer for Peter was answered. Jesus made no promise to remove Peter's upcoming test, and he prayed that his faith would not be shaken. In the Christian life, trials are to be expected. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, said the missionaries in Acts chapter 14, verse 22. God uses these experiences to shape our character, strengthen our faith, and make us more like Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, KJV. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, NKJV. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus is there to strengthen us and intercede on our behalf whenever we face a test. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. It's reassuring that Christ's intercession limited Satan's ability to sift Peter as wheat. When Satan pursues us, we must remember that Jesus Christ is always present to intercede on our behalf. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, NKJV. Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus had faith that Simon Peter would recover and help the other disciples. Another reason the Lord allows us to go through trials is to teach us how to assist others in growing in faith. 2 Coríntios chapter 1, verse 6, NKJV. Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Before his threefold denial, Peter was overconfident, relying on his strength. However, after being sifted like wheat, Peter discovered that failure is possible due to the weakness of the flesh. Mark chapter 14, verse 38. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter would have compassion and mercy for others now that he understood how easy it is to fall, while also assisting them in avoiding the same mistake. True faith and perseverance are revealed through repentance and restoration rather than sinless perfection. We get up and keep going after we fall, just like Peter, when Satan comes to sift us like wheat, we have an advocate in Jesus Christ who intercedes on our behalf. John chapter 17, verses 9 through 11, NKJV. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. John chapter 17, verse 15, NKJV. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. He will protect us so that the devil cannot destroy our faith and hope. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 28, KJV. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. 
Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, NKJV. Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus Christ began a good work in us, and he will see it through to completion. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We all make our way through the valley of failure. The question is, how will you respond? Many people give up and trade a vibrant kingdom-serving life for a defeated life. Failure, however, does not have to be the end. It is an opportunity for a fresh start in Christ's strength. The enemy expected to shake Peter's faith so hard that he would fall away from Jesus like chaff. Peter was headstrong about keeping his promise to Jesus. Even if all fall away, I will not. Mark chapter 14 verse 29. But Satan understands the power of fear. Satan's goal in sifting believers is to weaken our faith to the point where we are no longer useful to God. He wants us to stay out of the Lord's kingdom's activities. As a result, he focuses on our vulnerabilities, the areas where we believe we are invincible or at least well protected. When the devil succeeds, we are disappointed and demoralized. However, this does not have to be the case if we are willing. God can use failure to do spiritual house cleaning. Peter put his pride aside and donned the courage of the Holy Spirit. He then risked public humiliation, persecution, and death to spread the gospel. Failure was a catalyst for increased faith and true servanthood. It is a great comfort to know that God is always stronger than Satan and that by trusting in him, we can avoid Satan's wrath and receive a crown of life. But the text does not end there. God's word of comfort and hope continues. We require encouragement in our daily struggles so we will not abandon the faith and curse God in times of suffering and weakness. We need some assurance that the ups and downs of our faith will not culminate in a permanent downfall. In verse 32, Jesus gives us that encouragement and reassurance. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. It is reassuring to know that God is infinitely stronger than Satan and that if we trust God until the end, he will grant us eternal life. But it's doubly encouraging and hopeful that Jesus Christ and God the Father don't sit back and wait to see if we'll have the fortitude to persevere in faith. Notice Jesus prays to his Father for Simon. Now the word you is singular in verse 32. I prayed for you, that is, Simon. He asks God to do what he needs to be done to preserve Simon from destruction. Jesus is confident that his Father will answer his prayer because he says, and when you have turned, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knows that Simon will deny him three times. It is a temporary weakness, brief confidence faltering, but it is followed quickly by bitter tears of repentance. Luke chapter 22, verse 62. And turning, the father gave Satan the power to sift Simon despite, in response to Jesus' prayer, he did not let Simon fall through the sieve. Here is the double weapon of hope and encouragement that he gives us. We are not left without a shield against the enemy, nor are we left to hold the shield of faith merely by our strength. God will always see that faith has victory and that his children have faith. This is the meaning of that terrific text in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The sheep that are my own hear my voice and listen to me. I know them and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never ever by any means perish, and no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater and mightier than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one in essence and nature. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30, Amplified Bible. The strengthened becomes the strengthener. 
Our joy in God's promises is always multiplied when it spills over the brim of our lives and onto others. What about the remaining ten apostles? This can teach us a lot. God sometimes deals with you directly in the early morning, strengthening your faith alone. However, God strengthens our faith through another person most of the time. God sends us Simon Peter, who brings us just the word of grace we need to keep going. A testimony about how Psalm chapter 30, verse 5, Amplified Bible. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may endure for a night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning.